thank you all for coming tonight on this gorgeous night. I think it's really a testament to Ernestine Hayes' star power that we have a crowd of this size. Um, I'm Clara Mamura. I'm the outreach librarian at the Alaska State Library. So tonight's presentation is the third in the library summer lecture series. Next month for September 1st Friday, we'll have Stephen Jackson, also known as Jackson Paulus and Strawn Softy. He's going to come and talk about his work on the Seward totem pole that was re-raised in Saxman Totem Park in April. So we're honored to have Ernestine Hayes with us tonight, and I am really pleased that she's here with us this summer during the sesquicentennial year, um, and because I think her writing ties in really nicely with the museum's summer exhibit, Decolonizing Alaska. Uh, like Decolonizing Alaska, her writing is beautiful and powerful and challenging, and it speaks to the lasting impact of colonization. So if you haven't had a chance to see that exhibit, it's up through October 14th. Ernestine Hayes teaches writing at UAS. She's the author of several books, including The Dao of Raven and Blonde Indian, and she's the current Alaska State Writer Laureate. So thank you for being here, and I'll turn it over to you. Put this in, the, it's, it's turned down, but I just remembered it will buzz if someone calls me, so there. So thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate your presence, and um, I'm looking forward to the opportunity to uh, share some of my words. Some of the things I'll be sharing are um, from my book, and some of the things that I'll be sharing are points that I've made in other talks that I've given, but I don't apologize for repeating them because some things bear repeating. First, I'd like to thank the Occoquan people for allowing us to live and um, live on and love their beautiful land. And before I begin my talk, I would like to address before I begin to address the question of what shall we do with our heroes, I make two points that it is my practice to offer at every opportunity. First, almost every source describes the long record of native use and occupation that took place before European contact as prehistory. Indigenous groups, however, possess histories of thousands of years of occupation and exodus, relocation and settlement, exploration and discovery, embedded throughout the generations in legal process, artistic declaration, symbolic regalia, and oral tradition, at least as accurately and in many cases more accurately than the European system of writing that has been used for so many years to remove rights and appropriate lands. We must always remember that before colonial contact, native cultures possessed vigorous legal systems, effective educational systems, efficient health systems, elaborate social orders, elegant philosophical and intellectual insights, sophisticated kinship systems, complex languages, profitable trade systems, every social institution needed for a culture to flourish for thousands of years. Second. We do well to remind ourselves that had the colonial invasion not taken place, indigenous people would still be living in the 21st century. Our lives would still be modern. Paved roads, airports, and electricity would still occur. Some things would be different. We'd all be speaking our own languages. Our children would be receiving educations meant to lead to their success. We would not be so vulnerable to incarceration, alcoholism, poverty. We would be healthy. Gunachish. Lingit kainak sangachlacht. You chat to a sock. My clinket name is Sankachlacht. Gleitka kainak Ernestine Hayes. You chat to a sock. My white man name is Ernestine Hayes. Chak na ayachat. I am eagle. I am of the Burnt House People Clan. 
Gulchit ayahat, I belong to the wolf house. Gunach tedi dachan hatsiti, I am a grandchild of the Gunach tedi. Yan washa, I am a Kogwantan woman who traces her lineage through Klukwan. Shitgakwan, my clan springs from Sitka. I was born in the territory of Alaska at the end of the Second World War. For the first several years of my life, I lived with my grandmother in the Juneau Indian Village while my mother was in and out of the hospital for tuberculosis. After a few years, she came home to stay. Those summer days in Juneau were sweeter when I was a girl. The breezes more gentle, the sun's rays warmer, laughter more spontaneous, the possible future imprecise, but somehow bright. The distinctions that divided me from other children, wrinkled dirty clothes, absence of family at school time celebrations, unclean fingernails and dirty hands, no doubt a salty, unwashed smell, had eased upon my mother's return from her long tubercular stay in the hospital, and the coming separation from my classmates that would arrive with puberty was still no more than a wistfully approaching shadow. At that in-between age, anyone I met on my summer day wanderings might become a one-day friend. Anyone might join me for a rambling day of hiking up Mount Roberts, wading down Gold Creek, fishing off the city dock. So it was that morning I met two or three classmates, not quite strangers, not at all friends, white kids who lived in neighborhoods I didn't know, who wore clothes that were purchased from places other than the mail order catalogs my mother and I so eagerly anticipated, who attended churches where their parents, mothers and fathers praying together at elegant polished pews, walking hand in arm from dusted doorstep to reserve parking place, living together in veiled discontent and virtuous disapproval? Or was that simply what I'd already learned to tell myself in order to construct solace in an unconsoling world? Gave thanks to a just God that had arranged their success and guaranteed their continued rewards and those of their blessed children in whom they were all so well pleased. After some hellos, we decided to walk over to the docks to try out the new fishing pole one of them had just been given by his father. I promised to take a picture with my mother's Kodak she had lovingly consigned to me for the summer. The experience of fishing off the docks was always marred for me by the sight of struggling, gasping creatures, eyes bugged, delirious, terrified, bloody hook pulling at its thin lip, fighting with all the might of its soon-to-be succulent flesh for the freedom of the green water lapping the slimy, barnacle-covered pilings beneath our feet. My own escapades at fishing had mainly been limited to hunting for already severed halibut heads outside the loud wide doors of the cold storage which in a year or two would burst into a fire so large it woke the whole town, including my mother who would walk me by the hand to witness the extraordinary sight of high flames lighting the unstarred darkness. Our chatter was that of children, the excitement of a nibble now and then, neither fulfilled nor defeated by success or by failure. It was enough to be alive. I sensed the possibilities contained in friendship with these extraordinary children. The promise of entry, a relief from freedom, the security of belonging. Along with their friendship might come comfort, might come knowledge, might come understanding. Along with their friendship might come acceptance. I might be included. I might belong. The blonde hair boy began to snigger. Look at that drunk Indian carrying that fish. Let's get out of here. He pointed southward down the dock and began to wind in his line. I followed his eyes in the direction of his pointing finger to see an old man in a greasy wool jacket, dark fisherman's knit cap covering his head, a fresh halibut glistening from a length of twine wrapped around his fist. I squinted. That's my grandfather, I announced to the boy and his fidgety, giggling companions. 
Everyone tried to be quiet as my grandfather walked toward us. The other children, their derision ill-concealed by poor attempts to cover their snorts of laughter, took hesitant steps backward as my grandfather neared. Finally, we all stood too close to one another within the distance of a man's height, his reach, his life. The white children I dared to imagine as my friends staging their retreat behind me, ready to dash for the safety of another world. My grandfather in front of me offering a whiskered smile, saluting me with the heavy flatfish he proudly held up for my regard and admiration. I at the torn seam of two worlds. Dreams faded like dappling sunlight. The only choice, no choice at all. To embrace the life that had been designed for me, no less than the lives that, that had been designed by these ch children's parents for us all. To give back the proud smile my grandfather offered. To know that despite the fish slime, despite the day's old whiskers, Despite the headache and lost fingers and sharp grief, here was a man who understood what it meant to be proud. I took his picture and gave him a hug. I admired the salt fresh fish. We both knew he would sell it to some lucky cook and would use the money to buy more wine. We both knew it would take far more than a sunny afternoon for me to make friends of those softened pink children. We both knew that those children's fathers, though they ran the town and ran the schools and ran the courts and ran our lives, would never possess the courage that my grandfather showed every day by simply waking up and going on. We both knew that even though halibut cheeks were my mother's favorite summer meal, and even though there was no chance that we might fry one up tonight, my grandfather loved me as much as any grandfather had ever loved his wild, unreliable, unpredictable grandchild. My grandfather and all those Alaska Native men who endured the early years of the 20th century are my heroes. As a child in territorial schools, I learned the history of the United States to which Alaska belonged as an organized division until it became a state in 1959 when I was 14 years old. I learned about someone named Columbus who was said to have discovered a land now called America some 450 years before. I was taught the names of his three boats, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. I learned about the pilgrims who sailed on a ship called the Mayflower to a place called Plymouth Rock some 3,000 miles away. I learned about a man called George Washington who couldn't lie when he chopped down a cherry tree. I learned he threw a silver dollar across a river called the Potomac. I learned the names of the capital cities of all the 48 states. I learned how corn grew. I learned about cows and cowboys and good pioneering men and women who built log cabins and fought Indians. I learned about the Revolutionary War. I learned about the Indian Wars. I learned about the Spanish-American War. I learned about the Mexican-American War. I learned about the Civil War. I learned about the First World War. I learned about the Second World War. I learned about the Korean War. I learned about the Louisiana Purchase. I learned about Lewis and Clark. I learned about the Alamo. I learned about the Pony Express. I learned about Betsy Ross. I learned about a man named Seward, who I was told had bought Alaska from Russia for 7.2 cents an acre. I learned about Kit Carson. I learned about Daniel Boone. I learned about Davy Crockett. I learned about the 4th of July. I learned about Thanksgiving. I learned about Valentine's Day. I learned about Christmas. I learned about Jesus. I learned about John Wayne. When I was 15, my mother and I moved to California where I stayed for 25 long years. I never came home, not once, but not a day went by that I didn't long for home. Finally, when I turned 40, 
I said, let me go home or let me die with my thoughts facing north. It took me eight months to get from San Francisco to Ketchikan, living in my car, sleeping in shelters, standing in food lines. When I got to Ketchikan, I camped out from May to October, and then I found a job, found a place to stay, sent for my mother, sent for my sons, and two years later, I made it all the way back home to Juneau, and I know I love it more than if I'd never left. I had never finished high school, I dropped out when I was still in the 10th grade. I got a GED in San Francisco, learned to type, and that was the end of that. But I'd always said maybe one of these days I'll go to college. So just as when I turned 40, I said, let me go home. When I turned 50, I said, let me go to college. I signed up in a two-year program at the University of Alaska Southeast here in Juneau, switched over to a bachelor's program, and then I moved to Anchorage for two years to complete a master's of fine art degree in creative writing and literary arts. When I moved back home to Juneau, I began as an adjunct professor, then a part-time term professor, then a full-time term professor for several years. And this year, I received tenure at the University of Alaska Southeast Juneau campus, where I began my education those many years ago. To varying degrees, the lessons I learned in some of my college classes were as ethnocentric and colonial as had been those lessons in grade school years before. But my age, my experience, and sometimes my frustration allowed me to recognize that the colonial lens through which so many lessons were presented was not an absolute. And many of the professors reminded me that the colonial gaze was something to be critically examined. The colonial narrative was not the only worthwhile history. Colonial heroes are not the only ones in whose honor monuments ought be erected. A few years ago, on a visit to a village up north, I spent part of an afternoon in a grade school classroom. When I walked into the classroom, the students, third or fourth grade, as I recall, each had a photocopied map on the desk in front of them. It turned out that the assignment the children were carrying out, children living in a village on St. Lawrence Island in the Bering Sea, was to inscribe the dates and names of the first European explorers to reach the coasts of what is now North America and South America. I imagine those children were learning essentially the same lessons that I learned. I imagine children are still being taught about the Pony Express and the Pinta and the Nina. I imagine children are still taught about Lewis and Clark about the American Revolution, the Boston Tea Party, Betsy Ross, William Seward. Perhaps, like me, children today don't learn about the 15th century papal bull declaring war on all non-Catholic pagans and condemning them to slavery, which led to another papal bull sanctifying European dominion over all non-Christian peoples during the European Age of Discovery and the seizure of indigenous lands. I don't imagine children explicitly learn about the doctrine of discovery, which was based on those and subsequent papal bulls and which was perpetuated in 1823 by the United States Supreme Court. I don't suppose children explicitly learn about the theory of American exceptionalism and agrarian mission articulated as the doctrine of manifest destiny, which provided divine justification to American expansion over, under, around, and through any and all lands occupied and claimed by the inhabitants of frontiers. Named in the Declaration of Independence, we are all taught as merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. Seward, 
whom we celebrate with holidays and statues and street names and city names and sesquicentennial events, by the way, himself said in a speech at Sitka in 1869 that the Indian tribes will do here, as they seem to have done in Washington Territory and British Columbia, they will merely serve the turn until civilized white men come. And come to Alaska, they did. So what would we do if in the year 2020, only a couple of years from now, this American culture was suddenly subdued by another culture that believed theirs was the superior way of living. Their God was the one true God. Their language, the only worthwhile speech. Their history, the only history that mattered. What would happen if this young American society suddenly was rocked by cultural trauma? It's unthinkable, but let's suspend our disbelief for a moment to consider what would happen to our grandchildren's children if in the span of the next 50 or 60 years, a killing blow was delivered to the way of life we now know. What would happen? What would we do? We could no longer speak the English language. Schools, businesses, stores, everything would be conducted in some new language we didn't understand. Our laws would be swept away. No more regulations, acts of Congress, municipal codes, no more, no more executive tweets, no more laws as we now know them, no more doctrine of European discovery, no more American manifest destiny. Everything would be done according to some new legal system that we didn't understand and that was created and enforced in someone else's favor under a doctrine brought with them from some faraway place, a doctrine that conferred upon themselves the right, the power, the authority, the privilege to take what they please, to subdue, to dominate, to enslave to teach. Our religions would be abolished. Bible studies and communion and concepts like American exceptionalism would be seen as prehistory, evil. There would be no more in God we trust on our money. In fact, there would be no more money. The new currency would be in the hands of others. Our bank accounts, our property, our belongings would suddenly be of no value to us, and most of our remaining wealth would be taken. Our standards of beauty would be ridiculed. Our art would be trivialized. Our literature would become folklore. Our philosophers and great thinkers would be described as unsophisticated, quaint storytellers. All of our place names would be changed. Our names would be changed. We would be forced to celebrate peculiar holidays. We would be taught the exploits of someone else's heroes. Our children would be taken from us and sent far away where they would be forced to forget English, forced to dress in someone else's fashions, and forced to learn trades that prepared them for servitude. Taken from our influence, they would be given unpronounceable new names in a foreign language. They would not learn the history of their country, and they would receive the strong message that whatever they did, they would never be as good as those who were members of the newly dominant culture. Before long, no one would be learning English as a first language. Before long, our legal and educational and spiritual and social systems and beliefs would disappear. The day-to-day -day lives of your grandchildren's children would be characterized by unequal rates of incarceration, unequal rates of educational dropout, unequal rates of parental termination, unequal rates of suicide, addiction, poverty, depression, anger, shame, and all the other inevitable effects of cultural trauma. 
There would be no lack of reports and meetings and task forces and training devoted to addressing the problems of their failed assimilation. And 150 years after the sudden cultural trauma, we can hardly imagine a statue would be erected that celebrated the hero that brought about the obscene transaction that resulted in that trauma, a monument that effectively erased the occupation, the existence, the value of the American people who had lived in this place for almost 250 years. Unthinkable. Colonialism is domination. Political, social, financial, educational, colonialism is cultural violence. In light of the nature of colonialism, an important question we must ask ourselves is whether our image of Alaska can even exist without a narrative that exalts colonialism. Is it possible to construct an image of Alaska that does not rest on the doctrine of discovery, on manifest destiny, an image that does not express itself by honoring an instrument of colonialism who proclaimed that the purpose of indigenous people was to serve until civilized white men arrive? <coughs> Can the image of Alaska only be celebrated with monuments to colonialism, imperialism, manifest destiny, the arrival of a civilization that was and continues to be personified by white men who are held up as heroes no matter their words, no matter the consequences of their acts? Colonialism is an act of cultural violence that pursues and perpetuates subjugation as its primary goal. The impacts of that subjugation imposing alien constraints on meaningful indigenous values developed over many generations, replacing successful systems of education developed over many generations, erasing accurate methods of history keeping, of beneficial health systems, of vigorous trade practices, of all those social institutions that had allowed a sophisticated, healthy, vibrant culture to flourish for thousands of years. That subjugation, that colonial impact, has carried out its intended purpose. It has resulted in disproportionate rates of Alaska Native high school and college dropouts, disproportionate rates of Alaska Native poverty, disproportionate rates of Alaska Native substance abuse, sexual abuse, domestic abuse, self-abuse, suicide, just as colonialism is intended to do. Yet in the face of this colonial onslaught, in this, the sesquicentennial of Alaska Native resistance to that unlawful transaction, the gates of colonialism will not prevail against us. Indigenous languages are becoming more alive each day. See Alaska, Gold Belt, the University of Alaska, individuals, elders, teachers, museums, are working tirelessly to make indigenous languages and arts accessible to the generations. Indigenous art is being recognized as possessing contemporary as well as traditional brilliance. Artists such as Nicholas Galanin, Clarissa Rizal, Lily Hope, Preston Singletary, and many others represent the genius of indigenous arts. Indigenous literary expression traces a strong connection between oral history and written words, as demonstrated in the works of Nora Downauer, Ishmael Hope, Joan Kane, Robert Hoffman, and many others. Indigenous history, kinship systems, language, and other cultural aspects are being taught in public schools. Native cultural values are now familiar to all school children. Students and teachers in every grade are learning the importance of indigenous ceremony and belief systems. The lives of indigenous heroes who figure in Western history, especially American history, are the subjects of lessons and chapters and books. We are resisting the consequences of colonialism. We are attempting to turn this, 
this tide, we stand at the gates together. Years ago, when I lived among the redwoods in a tiny cabin in a place called Lomamar, for what seems now no more than an instant, yet longer than even a lifetime, was in California. My mother and the sons who were with me lived in the main house, which a fire had almost destroyed some months before, a house that was once high-end but had been sold to the young man who was now in the long process of restoring and replacing the burnt charred beams, the gutted kitchen, the water-damaged floors. It seemed that the only thing in the now bare house that dared to promise relief from the draft and the gloom were the newly installed windows and the stone fireplace that had survived the months with almost no sign of the catastrophic fire that had led to our camping in and around the now cold building, its bare rafters providing running space for the dozens of mice that had taken over the shelter, its uneven floor offering no welcome, its haphazard plumbing and wiring warning and thrill my meager attempts at making a home. But my mother liked that fireplace and she liked the fire. And she spent hours every day sitting on the fireplace stoop and tending the flames, adding twigs and branches and sometimes logs, no doubt dreaming of those days when she was young, when she was charged with the chore of helping to mine the cook stove flames or the smokehouse embers or the campfire blaze those days when heat rose unbidden from her body and radiated into the sky and warmed the fire itself. Now the scant flame from the few bits of kindling her grandchildren brought to her often failed to warm even the nearby air and never warmed her bones. Years later, a little wood stove sat in the corner of the mobile home I bought after we finally came back home to Juneau. It seemed that only parts of downtown and one or two places on the old road leading out to Ock Bay were as I remembered them. Everything else was new, had been built after Northern Oil had made the state feel rich. This trailer park seven miles from downtown had not many years before been willows and hemlock and black bears still nosed around on the streets looking for their old trails. I was happy enough to have raised myself enough out of poverty to have a trailer I could say I owned, although I still longed to live downtown where I could catch glimpses of myself as a young girl holding my mother's hand along the sidewalks and stairs of so long ago. My mother lived in a senior housing apartment right downtown and walked every day or so along the very street where she must also have glimpsed her own remembered shadows. My mother joined the rest of the family, my sons who tried with varying degrees of success to make their homes in Alaska, their partners, their children. In my age, mobile home for holiday dinners and for occasional birthdays, but my mother never made a move to tend the fire. Although she'd grown so lean, she was now no more than brittle bone and thin, cold flesh. She sat on the soft couch across the room from the fire, tucked into a bright new sweater, sneakered feet lifted onto a stool carried to the room only for her comfort. Surrounded by new babies and those generations who loved her and whose passions the years had not yet cooled and allowed herself to be warmed by no more than her memories and the inevitable regret of a life not fully lived. Some months after we made it back home to Juneau, my mother began to invite our little family to join her every year for Easter brunch at the Baranoff Hotel, just a short walk up the hill from the downtown senior housing, where having outlasted two other tenants, my mother had at last won a coveted corner apartment. The Baranoff had long been the emblem of the plush carpeted luxury normally available only to visiting dignitaries and their guests. On Easter Sundays, though, a grand brunch was open to the paying community. She saved up all year and insisted that the whole family accompany her to the mid-morning holiday meal. We surrounded her as she persevered step by step up the steep block. 
We were ready to support her, ready to catch her should she fall. Finally, at the entrance, she could not pull open the thick windowed brass door, which must have weighed more than she did those last few years of her scarred life. Once inside, she gathered her fearless bluster and strode on skinny stick legs to the reservation's podium, where she claimed our table and welcomed us to the feet, to the feast, while she picked at salted ham and cream puff pastries and fidgeted for her next cigarette, which after a life spent inhaling the smoke of unfiltered pell-mells, would inevitably, predictably, to her utmost surprise, eventually kill her. For as long as I can remember or Kodak pictures can commemorate, my mother brandished a perpetual frown. When she was growing up, she must have lived in constant fear of almost everything at our own family home in the village, almost everything in unfriendly white man schools and in forbidding white man churches, almost everything in dark, unwelcoming movie theaters, almost everything that came walking toward her down the street or crossed to the other side to avoid her. I imagine that before she was five years old by white man count, my mother developed a mean scowl that over the coming years quieted fussing baby brothers, whining little sisters, prim hard teachers, unwary school children in her grade and on the streets, all the pastors, case, case workers, cannery bosses, secretaries, judges, doctors, every single waiter and every maitre d'. I can suppose that she was still afraid of them. But when others were quieted by her frowning facade, she built up the nerve to walk by their widened eyes and find a place to sit with her back against a steady wall and glare everyone else at the Easter basket banquets into disconcerted silence while her loving family helped themselves to poached eggs and fresh cut cubes of melon. That last year, the year she died, she couldn't take us to the Baron off. She died the day after Easter. By then her concerns no longer centered on taking us to brunch to see us seated at a table that featured real cloth napkins and our choice of fruit juice or champagne. By then she had abandoned all thought of pell-mell cigarettes in favor of the loud humming machine that she told herself would help her regrow the lung tissue that had shriveled into emphysema, would help her regain that weight and muscle that had vanished breath by ever shorter breath, that would unswell her congested limbs, all that ruined wreckage having now left only her beautiful textured brown skin covering her still fierce bones. My mother and all the Alaska Native women who survived those early years of 20th century are my heroes. Indigenous history, indigenous philosophy, indigenous intellectual understanding are qualities that settlers and their descendants found threatening. Nevertheless, I'm here because of unacknowledged warriors like my mother and others like her, people who held their places in spite of injury and loss, in spite of cultural battery that would have undone others. Many families lost their art, their language, their history, their health, but they passed to us the awareness of power. We follow footsteps of the walking wounded in this cultural war, and everything we are able to accomplish we owe to them. When I was learning about heroes in history, I would have wanted to learn about Kathleen of the Kiksadi, Anna Hoots and Yaquan of the Kaguantan, Shaksani Kik of Gulchit, Net Nokwa of the Ottawa, Tecumseh of the Shawnee, and so many more whose accomplishments do not depend on their relationship to Western culture whose achievements are not described in the context of colonial oppression. Although many indigenous leaders have defended indigenous rights, have denounced oppression and inequities, have succeeded within the Western framework, 
framework, our children will not receive the complete human understanding of our history and our heroes without learning about the heroes who protected the inherent rights of indigenous people on their own land, who preserved indigenous values, and those who recognized the inescapable consequences of colonial invasion and resisted. Along with acknowledgement of the complexity of indigenous languages, along with the acknowledgement of the sophistication of indigenous thought, along with acknowledgement of the elegance of indigenous art, there is a growing call for acknowledgement of indigenous intellectual authority as secondary as well as primary sources. We are making progress. It is taking power, community, humor, and wit to turn this tide, common sense, friendship, and resolve. But of all those necessary qualities, it is community that will be our greatest strength. We are a community. Working together, we will overcome the intent of colonialism, and we will find new champions. We will tell new stories. We will adopt new narratives. We will celebrate new heroes. We will commemorate new histories. We will erect new monuments together as a community. This is the sesquicentennial of Alaska Native resistance. Let us not erect monuments to colonialism, but rather to equality. Let us not memorialize 19th century separatism, but rather 21st century unity. Let us not look backward with admiration, but forward with hope. Let us not glorify policies that advocate the destruction of other ways of life, but let us embrace one another in our shared humanity. In this most perilous time, at this sesquicentennial, let our choice be to turn away from actions that erase the existence and values of others' cultures. Let our choice be to acknowledge our equal humanity, to respect our equal humanity, to unite in our shared humanity. When we make those good choices, when we walk forward together, when we admit our shared histories and embrace our shared futures, we are heroes. We are all one another's heroes. Thank you. Gonna chase. Thank you. So I'm not sure what time it is, if we have time for questions and comments. I'm not sure. Hmm? Yeah. Feel so strongly. What do you think of the tradition that, that the Alaskans were greater mariners than Columbus or the pilgrims and that we discovered Hawaii in the Pacific? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm certain that um, indigenous people from this part of what is now Alaska uh, went, to, went to Hawaii, for sure. There's oral history that, that commemorates that. Um, and I, I do believe that um, probably almost everybody was better mariner than Columbus, wasn't he? <laughs> wasn't he lost? Was he lost? Yeah. Well, certainly, you know, certainly it, it resulted in genocide. It was based on genocide. We have to admit that, right? We have to admit that this 
this society that we're now, all of us are forced to live in, is, was founded on genocide and made wealthy by slavery. And we just have to admit that. And once we get to the point together where we acknowledge, where we acknowledge our history together, then we're going to go forward together because there's no other choice. There's no other choice, right? We have, we're here together, and we're going to go forward together. And I, I truly believe the tide is turning. And I think part of what is turning the tide is admitting our history, right? Admitting our histories and the consequences of the, that history. Anyone else? Comments, questions? Thank you so much. I appreciate your attendance.